We're at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, and I'm still Daniel Weinberg, and we appreciate you all being here with us today on this uh, wonderful Saturday. Uh, that doesn't seem like winter here in Chicago. Of course, it's always like that here, very mild. We just <laughs> put this out so you don't come crashing into us all the time, that we have a lot of snow. But people have come out very easily, and we appreciate all of you who have taken your Saturdays to be here with us. Uh, today, uh, first of all, I should really say that uh, while you're watching, if you'd like to email in a question, please do that. We'll try to get it on air while we're uh, here for the next hour. Don't forget to put your name and where you're from, uh, at least your first name, so we can shout out to you and say hello. We'd appreciate that. If you're watching on the archive, we'll probably have some books for you still signed as, the, as long as they last, so do come and get them when you can because they do finally run out, uh, even from here. So uh, if, you have, if you're on the archive, I hope you'll come back again and see us live. Uh, so today, uh, David Vandrelli, Oxford University Masters in Literature. That was some time ago, yes, not too much, but a long time ago. Yeah, now an editor at large at Time Magazine since 2006. Uh, he's been a recurring contributor to NPR's Morning Edition and a journalist for over 17 years, am I correct on that? Well, Including New York Bureau Chief for the Washington Post. He began his career as a political writer in 1992. Uh, he has been the author of a few books, uh, the, the acclaimed Triangle, The Fire That Changed America, which was an award-winning uh, book that New York Times called Social History at its Best, uh, also Among the Lowest of the Dead, and Deadlock, The Inside Story of America's Closest Election. Uh, I was almost going to get a couple of uh, <laughs> questions for that, but maybe we'll bring it in <laughs> the end. His latest book? one we are touting today for you is The Rise to Greatness, Abraham Lincoln and America's Most Perilous Year. It's a Henry Holt publication, 466 pages and illustrated, and costs $30. Uh, we couldn't get this into uh, 62. We're just barely into 63, so we're grandfathering it in for us right now. Well, David, usually I ask how you got to this book. I mean, you're not the first journalist to enter the historical field. I was no. thinking of Lloyd Lewis and Carl Sandburg, and we had uh, Ron Meacham in, uh, John Meacham in recently, and Douglas Southall Freeman. I'm bringing those into uh, classical historians that were journalists. Um, what brought you to this book? Uh, how did you uncover the import of this year and the unsustainable compromises that you speak of that held up for four score and six years to, to this point. Uh, so what brought you to this? Lincoln is a lifelong passion uh, for me. Uh, I can't remember when I wasn't interested in him and the Civil War like so many uh, young boys, the romance and excitement of it. Lincoln's uh, enormous personal magnetism and charisma that obviously drew people to him in his lifetime but continues to draw us to him 150 years later. Uh, but to write about Lincoln, uh, certainly for a non-historian, is intimidating as well. The statistic is thrown around, Daniel, you'd know better than I that there's 16,000 books about him. I don't know who counted them up. Uh, wow. So the idea of uh, writing number 16,001 is certainly intimidating. And yet, as I, it really was when I was uh, uh, reading years ago the David Herbert Donald biography, Lincoln, uh, that I reached the end of the year 1862, um, which if I recall is a chapter ending as well, uh, where he has just survived the cabinet crisis and the Battle of Fredericksburg has unfolded, the Battle of Stones River is underway in uh, Middle Tennessee, and he uh, prepares to sign the Emancipation Proclamation on the first day of 1863. 
I, I took a deep breath and asked myself, how did he survive this year? Uh, physically, emotionally, uh, mentally, politically, how did he even survive it? Uh, that led me to really dive into the year and I came to the conclusion that this is the pivotal year, the hinge, as I say, of American history, uh, where this long project of compromising the issue of slavery, the great compromise at the Constitutional Convention, the compromise over the Northwest Ordinance, the Missouri Compromise, the Compromise of 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act, all these projects to hold the Union together had become untenable. The country had broken apart. Uh, most great statesmen around the world believed that the North could not possibly subdue the South. It was too large, too strong, too rich with cotton wealth. Uh, this was the year when that first version of America died and potentially the country itself was going to die. And yet by the end of the year, with the Emancipation Proclamation, with Lincoln having learned the office of the presidency, really invented the modern presidency that year. Uh, it, to borrow from Churchill, it wasn't the end of the Civil War. It, it wasn't even the beginning of the end, but it certainly was the end of the beginning and the year that Lincoln became uh, the, the great man that uh, so many of us now admire. Well, how did your years as a political journalist help you <coughs> tackling this historical context here? Well, I like that question because um, Abraham Lincoln was, politics was his calling. Uh, this is what he, he was best at, and it is the kernel. There are so many elements of his success that had to come together, but I think the the one factor that was most essential was that he was the greatest politician of his age. And so many of his decisions uh, in this year, 1862, uh, but throughout his presidency, can only really be understood through the lens of politics. He had a tremendously difficult political problem to solve. Not only was he facing this rebellion, but he had to hold together a very fractious Union coalition. Uh, he had trouble on his left with the, the Republican Senate and House. He had trouble on his right with the uh, many Democrats who were still in the Union. Uh, and holding that together was uh, essential to subduing the rebellion. So did you did you look at this year through the lens of poli political journalism? Really? Absolutely. Uh, my, my first effort was to, you know, Lincoln is so large a subject, as we can see here in the Abraham Lincoln bookshop, so large a subject that to get into one volume is a real challenge. Uh, Sandberg, you mentioned, and I'm delighted to be on the list with Sandberg. Uh, now, did Lincoln did it with seven Gates volumes. <laughs> That's right, seven volumes. I think of the Sandberg biography, ten volumes Six. of the Nicolay and Hay biographies, two huge volumes of the great uh, Burlingame biography. Recently, uh, the other approach is to divide it up by subject, typically. So you get uh, Lincoln and race. Lincoln and slavery, Lincoln and his family, Lincoln and his hat, Lincoln and his dog. Um, what I tried to do was to focus it instead by one year so that we could get all these layers going at once and you could see that everything was happening at once. He wasn't able to deal with one subject one day and move on to the next, but it was a constant barrage. Uh, in doing that, I found that it was much easier to see the political context that he was operating in, the way it shifted, and the way he was trying to shift it, uh, both responsive to public opinion, but also trying to shape and lead public opinion. So, 
Well, you, you called it the hinge of American history, really. And what flowed from this hinge that uh, we should be aware of? And were they aware of it soon after that as well, that 62 had been a hinge? Uh, the, the Congress of 1862 is really the most productive and consequential, certainly of the 19th century, and maybe of our history. And if you just look at a few of their largest pieces of legislation, I think you get the idea. It, it, they're, they're, they're inking the blueprint of the modern America. They passed the Transcontinental Railroad Act in 1862. Uh, they passed the Homestead Act. That, That's the right. The, the Homestead Act in 1862, the Great Moral Act, creating the land grant college system, uh, an incredibly visionary and effective piece of legislation, uh, as well as you know less popular uh, things like the creation of the Internal Revenue Service <laughs> in 1862. Uh, but you can see as they create the apparatus uh, to run a government that's capable of, uh, of funding and executing this war, uh, and as this Republican vision that had been sort of stymied by the, the gridlock, political gridlock of the 1850s is suddenly unleashed, we get this whole vision of what the country's potentially going to be uh, from sea to shining sea uh, if only they can get through this crisis. You also say that 62 was uh, a hinge for the border states when they became more loyal than slave. Yes. So another consequence. I think that's true. Uh, the, the Republican abolitionist leaders in the Congress and around the country were so frustrated with Lincoln and his seeming obsession with the state of Kentucky. Uh, I had to learn uh, among other things, to write this book, I had to learn some geography. You know, now that we get around by flying on airplanes and driving across interstate highways, uh, we sort of lose track of how important the Ohio River was uh, to the United States in 1862 and what giving up that, that uh, huge uh, border of the Ohio River flowing into the Mississippi would have meant <coughs> to the Union war effort. And uh, but and, in the fall, I'm just going to say Lincoln flowed down. He was a man of the rivers. The, he had made. He had gone. Seen, he'd done it all. Right. <coughs> exactly as one a young man. One side slave, one side free. He had so, made those trips. He understood the commercial essence, importance of them. Right. Uh, he understood that he, here in the what was then called the Northwest, and now the Upper Midwest, that that their ties, commercial ties. Uh, were much stronger down the river to New Orleans and the south than they were back east. He understood that even the Union itself was very fragile if secession got started and took off and was successful. Um, so uh, he, uh, uh, but in the fall, late summer, early fall of 1862, uh, Robert E. Lee moves into the slave state of Maryland. Braxton Bragg takes his army, John Hunt Morgan, into uh, the slave state of Kentucky. Both men moving with the expectation that the slaveholders in these states were going to rise up and join the Confederate cause to throw off the yoke of the tyrant Lincoln. And lo and behold, what happens? Nothing. They get the cold shoulder. Barbara Fritchie is what they get. They get Barbara Fritchie. Um, and this, to me, is a sort of underestimated turning point of the war. So many hopes were pinned on bringing those slave states into the Confederacy. And uh, the fact that it didn't happen <coughs> is, is really a signal moment. Now, of course, uh, the Union wins the battles of Antietam and Perryville. But uh, the, when Lee and Bragg turned around and went back south, uh, it wasn't only because they'd been de defeated militarily, it was because the project of fomenting, extending the rebellion had failed.